Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Daphne Stereotis, and I'm an associate with CAQH Core. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to our webinar with Blue Cross North Carolina. In today's session, we'll start off with an overview of CAQH Core and our value-based payments initiative. We'll then turn the call over to Troy Smith for the featured presentation on Blue Cross NC's interoperability and value-based payments efforts. The second half of the webinar will be a panel discussion between core staff and Troy. We'll leave some time at the end for audience questions. A few reminders here, a copy of the slides and the webinar recording will be emailed to you all by tomorrow afternoon. You can also download the slides right now on the GoToWebinar panel on the right side of your screen. I also wanna encourage you all to submit your questions at any point during the webinar. Um, and we'll address those questions at the end once we get to our Q&A. And with that, I want to introduce CAQH Core Director, Erin Weber. Erin? Great, thanks Daphne, and thanks everyone for joining us today. We are really lucky to have Troy uh, joining us. Uh, Troy not only serves on our board of directors, but he has been uh, a co-chair of many of our value-based payment efforts over the past two years um, and, and really led some, some interesting discussions and development of rules, which I'll talk about in a second, um, to add value to the industry and streamline the exchange of information to support value-based contracts. Um, before we get into that detail, uh, for those of you that are a little bit newer to CAQH and CORE, I'm going to give you a brief update on who we are and what we do, um, and then we'll get into the details of our work in value-based payments. Uh, CAQH CORE is a industry-led uh, nonprofit uh, initiative uh, with a mission to develop operating rules to support the administrative data exchange in healthcare. Uh, we see our role not only as convening the industry to participate in subgroups and work groups to develop, vet, and uh, ultimately come to agreement on operating rule requirements, but also to support the industry adoption and deployment of those operating rules through our certification program, um, our measurement and piloting initiatives to track the impact of operating rules and standards, um, and then have a continuous dialogue with the industry, industry through education events such as these to understand where the pain points are and where uh, new rules and efforts could assist the industry. Uh, we are governed by a multi-stakeholder board of directors and designated by the Secretary of HHS as the National Operating Rule Author under HIPAA. Next slide, please. Um, so a little bit about what operating rules are. Um, they are uh, defined as the necessary business rules and guidelines for the electronic exchange of information, not defined by a standard or its implementation specifications as adopted. So operating rules really build on existing standards. They don't repeat the content of the standards and they cannot conflict with the conflict content of the standards. We have a couple examples on this slide here. Um, first is the eligibility inquiry. So when a um, provider sends an eligibility request to a health plan, operating rules specify some additional data content, including patient financials that must be returned in that transaction. Operating rules also specify infrastructure around the transaction, uh, that the transaction has to occur in real time and how that information is sent via certain connectivity methods to be supported by the industry. Operating rules are used in many industries, including financial services, transportation, et cetera, um, and they build on standards in similar ways. Next slide. Um, th this slide gives you an overview of our current uh, operating rule sets. We have eight sets of operating rules organized around the various business processes in the healthcare revenue cycle. Uh, you can see in the last row there, we have our, our newest set of operating rules, which is our attributed patient roster rule set, which I'll touch on later today. Um, some of our rules are federally mandated under HIPAA, and then some of our rules are voluntary and organizations are implementing them because they make good business sense. And we're happy to uh, talk with any of your organizations in more detail about uh, getting engaged in the development of the rules and then also the implementation of the rules. Next slide. 
So historically, CORE has developed operating rules for the HIPAA administrative transactions. Back, back, when, back when HIPAA uh, was originally passed, um, the industry was finding that the level of standardization and uniformity in those HIPAA mandated transactions was still not enough to allow for automation across uh, providers and payers. So they came together and formed CORE to develop these operating rules to add more consistency in how the information was being exchanged. Um, over time, obviously, operating rules have supported all of these um, administrative transactions and, and allowed organizations to uh, further automate their systems. A few years ago, our board came to us uh, with the recommendation that we move into the value-based payment space as they were experiencing many of the same challenges uh, with the implementation of value-based payments that they did back when HIPAA was first passed, where um, there was a lack of standardization in how organizations were exchanging data and more common expectations were needed um, to improve that information exchange and reduce burden and enhance transparency across the industry. So we did a lot of research uh, working with our board to identify opportunity areas where uh, operating rules could potentially have an impact. Uh, the first that undertook development of the attribution operating rules. Um, those rules, and I'll talk about them in a little bit more detail, um, our, our research uh, indicated that providers were very frustrated that they weren't receiving information about their attributed uh, populations in a timely ma manner, and then they weren't able to meet some of the requirements of the contracts um, and fulfill them in, in a timely way. So these rules really get at that challenge. Um, we are currently um, looking and researching opportunities uh, under quality measurement. Certainly there are many organizations working in this space already in terms of defining and creating measures. Um, but one of the major burdens we heard related to quality measures was an administrative burden in terms of how that information is exchanged. Um, so we are doing some research on uh, creating some more consistency in, in reporting of quality measures. And then future opportunities that were uh, discovered in this research included um, improved interoperability, no surprise there, um, but defining common process and technical expectations. Uh, risk stratification, similar to attribution, um, we heard uh, a lot of challenges from the industry around the lack of transparency in the models and the lack of consistency in what the industry is using. Um, and finally, data quality and uniformity, more consistent definitions of the data elements needed for value-based payments and also adoption of certain code sets that may help enhance the exchange of this information. So those are topics we continue to research and consider for future rule development efforts. Um, on the next slide, I'm going to dig a little bit deeper into the uh, patient attribution operating rules that were approved at the end of last year. Um, for those less familiar with this process, um, you know, within many value-based contracts, a set of patients are attributed to a provider, um, and then that provider is responsible for meeting certain uh, quality metrics uh, related to their care. Um, so this scenario here on the slide is an example of kind of the current state of exchanging patient attribution information where the provider becomes aware that uh, one of their patients may be in a, in a, is attributed to them for a value-based contract. So patient schedules the appointment, the provider sends the eligibility information, the health plan learns that the patient is eligible but um, not necessarily attributed to them. The provider submits the claim, but not necessarily the information needed to fully satisfy the terms of the value-based contract because the providers are receiving patient rosters of populations that really inconsistent intervals. Our research found that, um, you know, weekly, monthly, quarterly, um, and in different formats, um, it, whether it be an Excel file over FTP, et cetera. So there, there was a lot of variation in how this information was being sent to the provider. And if you can imagine you're a provider with a significant patient population working with multiple health plans and multiple contracts within those health plans, um, it's very hard to keep track of all of that information. Next slide, please. So the CEQH core participants under Troy's leadership um, developed a uh, two sets of operating rules related to attribution. The first is the attributed patient roster operating rule set. 
Um, and that's related to an entire roster of patients. Um, uh, this rule set in particular identified um, a set of data within a version of the X12834 member reporting transaction um, designed to exchange information about members. Um, the two rules were developed within this set, a data content rule, which standardized the minimum data elements the health plan needed to send to the provider to help the provider identify who was in the, in the population including the contract name and effective dates of the attribution. So the provider actually would be aware of when, when this attribution applied to the patient. And then with all of our operating rule sites, you may have noticed on the previous slide, we always have an infrastructure to rule to create consistency in how that transaction is sent and received between the provider and the health plan. Um, so similarly here, we have a, 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 a infrastructure rule that addresses uh, our typical infrastructure requirements related to connectivity, um, acknowledgements, response time, um, and in this particular rule, there is a requirement that the health plan send an updated attributed patient roster at least once per month. Um, and so that's very helpful that the provider is able to have consistent expectations as to when that information might be received. Um, you know, we know there are um, a lot of other activities underway um, in terms of using FHIR to exchange this information as well. Um, so we continue to track that work and, and ensure alignment of these rules as well. Next slide. Um, so the, the first set of rules I talked about was the attributed patient roster rule set. This rule in particular relates to exchange of attribution information for a single patient. So um, as I've mentioned before, CAQH Core has a set of eligibility and benefit operating rules. This is a new rule that is part of that eligibility operating rule set. Um, so when a provider is uh, seeing a patient, they may not be aware of that patient's attribution uh, status at the point of service, which can result in leaving care gaps and other reporting um, you know, unfulfilled until well after the patient's visit. Um, and so the core participants developed this rule to require additional data elements um, on that eligibility transaction to convey whether or not, to convey the attribution status of the patient, you know, yes, no, or partial, and the effective dates of that attribution are included in the eligibility response so that a provider can understand when they do an eligibility inquiry or not a patient is attributed to them. Um, so that rule um, is now part of the eligibility operating rule set. Um, so next slide, please. And, and this slide is really um, showing the flow related to attribution, but with the benefit of these operating rules. So when the patient schedules an appointment and the provider does that eligibility inquiry, they know right then and there whether that individual patient is attributed to the, the, the provider. Um, and then because they are receiving those attributed patient rosters at regular monthly intervals um, with consistent uh, data elements across health plans, they are able to adjudicate, uh, they are able to submit the, the data needed and the claims information needed for the health plan to adjudicate uh, the value-based uh, payments at the end of the year. And then in terms of next steps for our uh, value-based payment work on the next slide, um, Core certification will be available for these new operating rules at the beginning of 2022. So if uh, you think these are rules that your organization would benefit from or industry would benefit from more broadly, um, you can certainly implement them now. The rules themselves are available uh, for implementation and then certification on the rules will be available at the beginning of next year. In addition, we, as I mentioned, are doing some research into um, to support the exchange of non-service related clinical information to support uh, value-based payments. So we are conducting an environmental SAN to understand the pain points. And some of the opportunities we're seeing bubbling up are um, potentially a standard quality measure reporting CDA template or promotion of provider adoption of CPT2 codes to increase the data submitted on the claim um, and measure the impact um, on the provider's time um, in and payment um, in doing that. So we're continuing to conduct interviews and if you're interested in learning more about that work, um, please do reach out to us. 
Um, at this point, I think I will turn it over to Troy, who's going to talk a little bit more about the work that Blue Cross North Carolina is doing to both advance interoperability and value-based payments. Troy? Thanks, Aaron. Hi, everyone. I'm Troy Smith. I'm Vice President of Healthcare Strategy and Payment Transformation at Blue Cross Blue Shield of North Carolina. Thanks for joining us today. Um, my scope really at the plan focuses on, on three different dimensions, uh, value-based care, how do we define a program? How do we implement it? How do we operate it? Uh, divisional planning, uh, program execution, how do we make sure that we know where, where we wanna go as well as have the right resources and capabilities to achieve our goals? And then finally, uh, my team handles a lot of our cost management, cost containment activity as it relates to uh, admin cost and medical expense cost. So, Interoperability, value-based care, this is kind of my sweet spot and I'm very happy <laughs> to be here today. Mm -hmm. um, so if we look at advancing interoperability and value-based payments, um, just a little bit about our plan. Uh, we have 4 million members, about 3.9 million members today. That's across all lines, all segments. Um, mainly we are a, a group plan, uh, but we have a pretty sizable MA uh, population, Medicare Advantage population as well as uh, under 65 Affordable Care Act population. We are the majority of North Carolina's commercial market today. We, we do have um, a significant market share, but as North Carolina is growing, also our competitors are coming into our state. And um, uh, we, are, we are trying to navigate that change <laughs> as we go. We have about 5,000 employees. It's a little bit higher if you include contractors, but we're one of the largest employers in the Triangle, uh, the Raleigh-Durham area. We are about a $10 billion plan, uh, and we're recognized as a leader around fee-for-service, moving from fee-for-service to value. And then uh, we're using technology and data to make sure that we're personalizing healthcare to make it better, simpler, more affordable. Next slide. So this little basic slide I thought would be a good baseline for all of us to align on. Um, where, where are we going with interoperability? Um, hopefully at your organizations or at your plans, you have a similar view or, or your provider organizations. But, but really, we are seeing interoperability take off across a couple different dimensions. Uh, right now, we're categorizing it very basically across patients, providers, and payers. You can kind of see there on the, on the left third of the diagram. And really, when you look at all the intake or the input and output um, capabilities that, that we have, when you look at the CMS interoperability rules, when you look at what we need to do uh, just currently for like EDI transactions uh, as it relates to core, there is a growing uh, list of different touch points, different formats, um, different interaction modes that we're seeing there on the left. And really what we're trying to do is, instead of focusing just on the technology on the left, we're really trying to be laser focused on what our goals are. You can see our, for each uh, dimension, whether it's patient, provider, or payer, we're really trying to be clear on what our goals are and how does that sink into interoperability. So it's not just tech for tech's sake. It's really, if you have a goal to lower admin or admin expense or medical expense, trying to make your product more affordable, what do I need from the interoperability um, team to be able to make sure that we were able to hit that goal? What are the technologies that are available to us? And then finally, how do I roll that out to the actual stakeholders on the far left? And um, one of the things that we're noticing is that there's just like a, a large um, mushrooming of potential here <laughs> when, you, when you're looking at like how many vendors are coming in, how many new ideas are coming in, when you're looking at all the new fire standards, when you're looking at the folks that are uh, uh, enabling fire and how does that fit into your current um, like kind of like core uh, EDI stack. This is probably one of the, the biggest areas of focus for us right now as a plan because we're really trying to figure out what does the technology mean, how does it align to our goals, and where do we need to go with our investments and our roadmap um, as it relates to other programs. And we're going to talk more about that in the Q&A, but this is just a base background for everyone to, to anchor on. Go to the next slide, please. 
Another piece that comes through, and uh, I think some of the, the direct questions that came in prior to the seminar or webinar, uh, really related to what, what are you doing in the value-based care space and how does it relate to me? One of the things that we're most proud of at our plan is our Accelerate to Value program. And the idea of this, if we go next slide, um, was when, when COVID was really taking off last year and we were hearing about the hardships that were going on with independent primary care, we saw like a 40% uh, decline in average revenue uh, depending upon different markets uh, for independent primary care practices. And uh, we knew that even, even if we wanted to do value-based care, uh, having physician groups shutter their businesses, having members not being able to have access to primary care, we were heading for a, a crisis. And so our, our North Star on this is that it was, we need to keep thinking about affordability, we need to keep thinking about access, how do we make sure that everybody stays solvent? And we also wanted to make sure that um, we had a, like a long-term vision. So it wasn't just about um, helping to, uh, helping independent primary care um, with like a bridge loan, but like what does it mean for the longer term play, especially as we were thinking about increasing medical expense. We didn't want them to be acquired by a system or, or perhaps a competitor. We truly wanted them to remain independent. Can we go to the next slide, please? So our guiding principles, we came up, we wanted to provide financial stability, access, as I mentioned, we wanted to provide a bridge to the Blue Premier program. This was really a way to strongly encourage folks to come into value if they weren't in value today. And then finally, how do we stabilize them to remain independent? And going to the next slide, we had four key parts to our program. One is that we wanted to stabilize them, stabilize their practice revenue. What this really meant was if, if 2020 had a lot of noise and trend, a lot of noise and consumption as far as uh, primary care was concerned, Let's see what their what a normal year, quote unquote, looked like in 2019. And if there was a way to give them some upfront payments um, to be able to get up to 2019, we were looking at doing that. The next piece was like, how do we make sure that we're encouraging quality and doing care coordination, not just a, a financial loan, but really actually trying to move the needle on our other goals throughout the program. And you can see there, we wanted to make sure that everyone had access, provide telehealth, especially when we were looking at social distancing, uh, going into the, the heat of COVID there, uh, provide care coordination activities responsive to the COVID-19 pandemic. And so this was aligned with not only our, our plan goals, but we also wanted to align with our state's Department of Human and Health Services as well. The third, the third uh, pillar there, we want we we strongly encourage everybody to join Blue Premier and ACO by December 31st. We have a number of aggregators in our state, um, Allidate and Caravan, for example. And if they had the opportunity to get assistance from one of those aggregators as a as a way to transition into Blue Premier, we were encouraging that. Also, if they had enough members and they wanted to come in independently, we we're also giving them that option as well. And then finally. Uh, we are looking at doing uh, primary care capitation. This was not a, a required element of the program, but we are seeing that uh, stable cash flow and uh, broadened cash flow, let's say not just on a fee-for-service chassis, but a, perhaps a capitated ca uh, chassis allows for different types of investment, different types of member engagement, uh, different outcomes. And so when we do develop primary care capitation and roll it out. We want them to be first uh, to take a look at it to see if it's something that they're interested in. Next slide. So how do we do? So uh, we had 513 uh, practices uh, be part of uh, this program. Many of them, about half of them, let's just use basic math, were already part of the Blue Premier program. But 203 new practices came on board into Blue Premier, which is our which is our value-based program. And by doing so, we increased our base of members in overall Blue Premier by about 150,000 members. Which, when we are looking at an overall um, base member participation list of about 1.5 million members, 
we saw a lift of about 10% in our Blue Premier program through the introduction of this program. We also were able to, stay, to help uh, these practices become financially stable in our state, and we did not have to see any of them shutter up or uh, uh, transition into a health plan or to a competitor. And then I think the last slide just kind of shows the, the reach of what we're looking at here. Our Accelerate to Value program, uh, we have 100 counties in our state. Uh, we touched almost every one of them with our program. And so we, we know that we impacted physician, um, physician lives, practice lives. We impacted member lives uh, by doing this. And it was the right thing to do to help everyone get through the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic. And so with that warm up, I think we're going to move over into the Q&A portion. Thank you, Troy, for your timely presentation. Um, my name is Jessica Porras. I'm the Senior Manager for Education and Policy at CAQH Core, and I'm going to uh, guide the next few minutes of our conversation with our speakers. Uh, the first few questions are for Troy and focus a little bit more on what Blue Cross North Carolina is doing with its BBP initiatives. Uh, so, Troy, um, you've set a goal of having all your customers covered under Blue, Blue Premier uh, contracts within five years. To date, how has the Accelerate to Value program assisted in reaching this goal? Yeah, so as I mentioned, we got a 10% lift in our membership aligned uh, members aligned with a physician that's part of, of a value-based program. So uh, Accelerate to Value did a great job. Uh, what we're noticing on trying to have 3.9 million members uh, in in a value-based or part of a value-based care program, we are we're hitting some headwinds, and and the reason is a, a couple of them. Many folks don't align with primary care physicians out of the gate. A lot of plans. Let's just use some simple math. You might have 10% of, of your, your members not ever go to the doctor in one year, especially commercial members. And so, you know, trying to encourage them through things like PCP selection, um, member campaigns, uh, that sort of thing. We're seeing some nominal lift on that, uh, but it, it, is, it is a little bit challenging. The other part, when you're looking at that goal of trying to get everybody to, to align with uh, a value-based program, hopefully through a primary care physician, is that a lot of folks just consume specialty care outright. They will, go, they will go to their dermatologist once a year, or they'll go to uh, their cardiologist once a year. And so when you have a primary care driven ACO model, uh, funneling everyone into that PCP experience up front, that is going to be where we're focusing on um, just trying to grow, grow that base over time. That makes a lot of sense, Troy. Um, I want to pivot a little bit uh, to interoperability and the beginning part of your presentation. Um, yeah. Can you share uh, any insights on your progress meeting the new interoperability and patient access rules coming out of CMS and ONC? Um, have your investments to meet these rule requirements um, impacted uh, your broader strategy? Yeah, so one of the one of the rules that came up was just price transparency, let's say, as far as like what CMS is asking for. I, like a lot of other blues plans and national plans as well, uh, we, we have costs or treatment cost estimator tools where depending upon your benefits and what you're having done, we've we've had that kind of capability in place for years to just say this is what we estimate your out of pocket impact to be. We took it a step further um, about six, seven years ago, where we did publish a lot of our just kind of core rates. Uh, we amalgamated them rather than showing distinct rates by hospital or physician to complement that treatment cost estimator tool. And it was a way to be transparent on, on what we thought costs would look like. That both of those experiences have really allowed us to grow into like where we're going with CMS because when CMS is saying you, it's like another nuance that we're looking at with, with transparency. We're, we're able to build on the data extracts and the technologies to post and share that information and um, 
take those pieces and, and turn it into a meaningful program to hit the CMS mandates. So I feel like on those pieces, we're okay. Things like when we're talking about the payer-to-payer -payer API, we're investing in those today, we're, we're growing those. But a lot of it is just trying to make sure that we're hitting the 1-1-22 date. So everything, the, I think the insights will come. I think right now we're just trying to get compliance, but we're building on the things that we already have in place already today as kind of like the core nucleus as we go. And I know it's a challenge, particularly given the last uh, year and a half we've had with COVID. So <laughs> yes. um, and that takes us on to the next uh, few questions, which are you know a little bit more focused on COVID and its impact on, on healthcare more broadly. Um, so Troy, um, at the start of the pandemic, telehealth vis visits increased by a lot, uh, in some cases mm -hmm. over 7,500%. Um, uh, what are opportunities and challenges do you see for Blue Cross North Carolina and the industry at large with telehealth, health, forgive me, telehealth services? Yeah, so historically, when we look at telehealth pre-COVID, it was kind of like a, a buy on group business. A um, lot of vendors out there, what kind of offering do you want to have for your employees for a consistent experience? And then in parallel, you had a, a lot of uh, large um, specialty groups as well as health systems start to use their own platforms like Epic was exposing out to, um, telehealth capabilities. And I think uh, that base was very positive when we pivoted into COVID because uh, being able to have remote access, align it uh, where people with polychronic conditions were able to talk to physicians, that, that was, that was key to help maintaining costs and access and, and talking about things like prescription refills, et cetera. For the plan, part of, part of telehealth is, you know, th there's this kind of like yin and yang argument. It's a channel for care delivery, but then if you're just, if it was just a pure telehealth startup, the cost structure is very different than if you're trying to uh, integrate the cost structure of telehealth into an existing practice. Um, we have gone in um, many different directions around telehealth reimbursement par parity over time. But when COVID hit, we went, we went all in and we made uh, telehealth uh, on par with an in-office visit. I think that's here to stay. I think the thing that is going to be challenging to now directly answer your question, Jessica, is, is that um, what, what do we really mean with telehealth uh, as far as like expectations? Is it just for kind of the routine care? How does it integrate into home health? If you're in a value-based contract, do we, see, do we want to see the, the, the number of ends tick up over time with telehealth visits so that we know people are able to get remote care versus facility-based care? And so I think we're, we're past the introduction argument. I think we're getting past the reimbursement argument. Now it's like, what are you gonna get for it? That, that's where I think we're headed with telehealth. Well, and that's a perfect segue for my next question, which is for Aaron. Um, so given the surge in interest, and you, you um, how is CAQH core addressing any inefficiencies or administrative burden in the telehealth space? Yeah, that's a good question, Jessica. So early, early in the pandemic, um, you know, our team came together and we talked with the board about, you know, are there opportunities where CAQH4 can help, um, particularly in the areas where we excel in terms of creating more consistency and standardization? Um, and uh, two areas within the operating rule sphere came up. The first is within our eligibility work. And, and as I've mentioned, you know, we have a set of eligibility rules um, that um, support that transaction and exchange. And right now we have a task group underway to update some of the requirements in those rules. Um, it's, it's time now. And one of the uh, key uh, requirements being considered is how to address the emergent need to communicate telemedicine specific eligibility and benefit information through appropriate code use. So there is a task group right now working through the details of how to do that using the eligibility transaction. 
Um, the second area where we see a role is within our um, remittance advice transaction. And within that, we have a set of rules around uh, the de uh, adjustment and denial uh, codes used. Um, and that task group is going to be considering very soon whether there are any additional code combinations or business scenarios that are needed to convey an adjustment or a denial and a remittance transaction related to telemedicine. So that work, uh, I, I believe, is happening uh, this month. Um, and then finally, you know, there's just a general need for more education for the industry on this topic. So we are partnering with Weedy um, over the course of this year to do a couple webinars, um, both with telehealth experts and providers who can talk about their experiences um, and the policies that are coming out um, for the longer term. So keep an eye out for those sessions as well. Um, the next couple of questions um, I wanted to ask is, uh, for, for either of you or both of you. Um, so what have been some of the short and long-term lessons learned over the past year, especially with the COVID pandemic uh, regarding your value-based delivery networks? I, I can talk high level and then Troy, you can probably talk more uh, on the ground. Um, you know, what, what we're hearing a lot is more new thinking around systems of care. You know, what is the value of incorporating telemedicine into payment models uh, to Troy's point? Um, and is that, and how do you do that in a way that reduces the billing and coding burdens associated with that from a fee-for-service perspective? I think there's other opportunities that are, um, the industry is just more comfortable considering and talking about as a result of this, which is, you know, treating patients in different settings like hospitals at home models and outpatient rather than inpatient settings. So I think there's an opportunity there to kind of reset um, where care is provided. Um, and I think too, the other topic that keeps coming up is um, addressing disparities um, in, in healthcare and, and equity. And are there opportunities for these payment models to address some of the challenges relating to social determinants of health, inclusion of safety net providers in value-based contracts and community partnerships. And so um, those are some of the high level themes that we've been hearing in our conversations. Absolutely agree. I think the one that stands out for me the most is the, it's not only virtual care that employer groups are talking about more, but it's also the hospital at home piece like Aaron highlighted. from from just a experience standpoint, convenience standpoint, availability and access standpoint, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. When you're talking about like, how does it impact folks in a value-based contract? If you're moving stuff that was an inpatient or outpatient to a home setting, and there is some somewhat of a, a fee differential on that, you're enabling your shared savings program, as well as you're increasing your, your uh, member satisfaction scores. So that's a positive. And uh, I think that um, just like with like working from home or <laughs> hybrid work environments, let's say, I think that's going to percolate over to, to just care, you know, that we're, we are going to be more flexible about thinking about different sites of care. And it's, it's due to just our collective COVID experience. That makes sense. Um... Another question that I think is uh, can be for either of you or both of you, um, where do you think providers are in terms of their willingness to take risk with BVP models uh, given the recent uh, crisis? Is this, this, has this created a space for more or less risk? You know, I, I think throughout the pandemic, we've been hearing that providers in value-based payment arrangements, particularly capitated payments, are, are faring somewhat better financially given the more consistent revenue streams. Um, so I, I think that is causing providers to rethink their willingness to take on risk in, in these different scenarios. And does it actually mean more stability in, in times of crisis? Troy, has that been your experience? <laughs> somewhat. Um, I think yeah. you are absolutely right when you think about capitated payment. Um, if you were on a capitated payment, you were able to ride out the highs and lows of the visits and your income was, was stable. And I think that going back to the A2V part of the presentation, that's one of the selling points of moving into a capitated model is that you moderate your cash flow. The flip side is a lot of 
when you when you are using a trend based model to say this is what last year's PMPM looked like, and this is what this year's PMPM needs to look like. So one was your benchmark and one was your target. Having these like, uh, like I'm gonna use like property and casualty term, like acts of God or force majeure <laughs> type of events come through, it makes it hard to have predictability. And so the appetite for risk, um, the appetite for risk may still be there, I think Jessica, but the the challenge is going to be how do you as a payer and as a healthcare organization come up with ways to talk about when does trend need to readjust? What are the, what are these like catastrophic events? What, where do you go back for your baseline? And it all, it's all gonna come down to like, how do I make it more predictable as I'm taking risk? I think that's, that's probably gonna be the challenge going forward is how do we work through, uh, probably the biggest unpredictable event that we've had in recent times. It's interesting that we're sort of learning and implementing policies, um, not on the fly, but, you know, in, yeah. in real time, right? Yes. Um, so the last few questions are a little bit more, more core, CAQH core and operating rule specific. Um, so Troy, um, could you tell us what sparked your interest in becoming a CAQH core board member? Yeah, um, so Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, is is a member of CAQH core. Uh, and when the opportunity came up to represent our plan, um, I, one was just to get more exposure and learning. You know, uh, I did I had some prior experience at United Healthcare in Minneapolis, and <clears throat> my role at at the plan at that time, <clears throat> excuse me, was to help roll out a new provider portal where we're rolling out EDI transactions. So coming over to CAQH core after all that time was just really, how do I catch up on this? How do I see where, how, how do I see where it relates to like healthcare strategy and then uh, learn and grow. And that when I look at the stakeholders that are involved in, in the program and as I've worked with the CAQH core team over time, it, it's been a great benefit for me because it's it's rounded out my knowledge and also I think we've been doing some real meaningful work. And we definitely have appreciated it. Thank you, Troy. Um, another question for you and then I'd love to hear um, Aaron's perspective on this. So there's been a lot of discussion lately on the industry's use of X12 and FIRE transactions to support the exchange of, of data. What role yeah. can CAQH or play to help bridge the gap um, since not all organizations are at the same level of, uh, let's say, maturity in using the various transactions. So, so how can CAQH Corp uh, help bridge that gap? So that kind of goes to my interoperability slide as well as what Aaron's uh, slides at the beginning. When you think about all the different changes that are coming through, all the new technologies, the standards, you know, fire standards are remaining relatively constant, but when, when you're looking at just the amount of change, what, what I like about the current mission of CAQH is to be the voice of like saying that this is how we need to get the operating rules out there, having a forum for everybody to get together, say, this is how we aggregate, this is how we decide, this is how we roll it out and then having the communication vehicle to be able to actually implement it. And so for me, what, when I'm looking at the future uh, of change, it's not that the, tech, uh, the technology is evolving, but that core change management process of like, how do you get everybody aligned to a common vision? And how do you get everybody to adopt the change? That's where I see CAQH leadership growing over time. Uh, and uh, I think it's part of the core mission uh, from HIPAA and beyond. Yeah, I mean, I, I think building on Troy's point, you know, we, we see X12 transactions at, have always been for the longest time, the backbone of that administrative data exchange and exchange. And then the momentum for fire APIs just continues to build, particularly related to the alignment of the clinical and administrative data exchange within this kind of continuum of technology, industry stakeholders, as Jessica put, are at varying levels of maturity. So we have early adopters who are testing 
new API-based use cases, while others have more limited resources for innovation. And we're seeing some gaps emerging between these entities using the kind of existing and emerging standards um, due to um, a lack of alignment in use cases. And, and it could become an impediment to interoperability if not addressed. So I think that there's a real opportunity uh, for CAQH Core and the industry to demonstrate some leadership here and think through what is the role of standards and operating rules and code sets. I don't think this is something that one organization can can solve, but it's it's really key to come together, create some consistent business processes, and perhaps align the data and the infrastructure regardless of the standards, so that we all have the same expectations, but we may be in different places along the technology spectrum. Absolutely. Um, so uh, next question is for Troy. Um, in your role as a, the chair of our value-based value payment initiative, um, where do you see the greatest opportunity to streamline the administration of value-based payment programs? <laughs> um, one of the things that, that just in general what we're seeing now <clears throat> is that we, there's a fair amount of duplication that takes place both between payer and provider. We'll, we'll have a, a claim set uh, or a data warehouse. We'll do, a, we'll do a claims extract. We'll do an attri attribution extract, other reporting extracts. We'll send it over to um, a provider. The provider is ingesting it perhaps into their own value-based platform. We may have our own value-based platform. Um, then there's other reporting that we're doing. There's other reporting that the ACO or provider entity is doing. And so there's a lot of just everyone trying to figure out how to enable each other um, and be successful in value-based care. And so how I see things evolving over time is I think we're going to get better at describing who needs what. Um, if a health system or an ACO or a value partner, multi-specialty practice, whoever, if they have the ability to just ingest core data, if, if all we need to do is share data more readily and more frequently, I think that would relieve the administrative burden on, on the payer side. The flip side is if the provider doesn't have that ability today or, or they may not be big enough to invest in a platform like that, uh, then I think right-sizing what from the payer side, right-sizing our own value platform, our own reporting platform for them would be the, the right way to go. I feel like we're going big on both sides, and that's something that um, I'm hoping over the next three, four years, we figure out how to consolidate and have different expectations of each other. That makes sense, Troy. Um, so Aaron, you had mentioned earlier during your presentation, you talked about our participants and our board. So how how do you work with participants and the board to ensure that priorities align with our long-term strategy, especially with value-based payments? Uh, lots of communication and constant research. Uh, we do an annual survey of our participants, uh, usually in the August, September timeline to better understand their priorities for Kind of a one to three year time frame um, and then we work through it with the board um, but we you know we are constantly out there listening to what's going on in the industry as both staff and board members um, and uh, getting outreach directly from our participating organizations you know that to say hey have you guys thought about this or hey here's an area where i really think uh you know the industry can come together and create some some standardization and some consistency. And so um, it really is just um, keeping an ear to the ground and constant communication and then working with the board to say, um, you know, what's what's our top priority or what are our top three priorities among these identified opportunities um, and, and that we go through every single year. Yeah, and I think, you know, that's part of the reason why I like working here. <laughs> it's for communication. So um, thank you so much. Uh, yeah. That's right. Thank you so much, Troy and Aaron, uh, for having this conversation with me. And now I'll send it back to Daphne, who will guide the Q&A portion of the webinar. Thanks, Jessica. 
Um, so as a quick reminder, please submit your questions into the panel um, on the GoToWebinar dashboard. I'll jump right into it with a question on care management delegation models. Uh, Troy, can you speak to um, any sort of agreements that you have um, with uh, providers about care management delegation models? Right. So that one that one's a tricky one because we are NCQA certified. And so in order for us to do any type of delegation, we need to make sure that we are not only fulfilling the standards through that delegation to that other entity, but then we also have to go out and audit it, meaning the the uh, the delegated entity. And so for us, uh, we haven't done too much uh, delegation in the past. We have pockets of it. Over time, and, and um, this may be where your question's going, if a, if a provider organization or an organization that's in a value-based contract, a risk-based contract, has a better care coordination, has a better care management model, we want to get out of the way. We, we want that organization to be able to do it. And so I could see delegation growing over time. The part that we need to figure out uh, is like, how do we make sure that we're aligning with all the other accreditation standards as we go? Um, but I think it will help everyone's not only member experience but, and, and staff experience, but also it's going to help us keep care more affordable because instead of having two entities ready to go on care coordination and care management, we're getting it right to the provider um, and letting them uh, handle their patient. Thanks, Troy. Uh, the next question is for Aaron on the operating rules. So is CAQH core promoting any specific logic or rules for determining attribution? That's a great question. Um, when we did the initial research related to attribution, that was definitely one of the pain points that came up, particularly from the provider perspective, is that there was a, a lack of transparency in how the attribution was being done and, and that there were varying uh, models being used. Um, from a pure operating rule definition, um, that decision-making process really lies within the plan policy. And so we, uh, the core operating rules are really focused on improving data exchange and the information that needs to be shared. So um, when it comes to health plan policy decisions, that's probably less of an area where we would spend time. Now, we would certainly um, consider doing uh, more education, industry education. I think we did a webinar actually uh, a couple of years ago with NQF on some of their attribution work. Um, and so that would probably uh, be the best place to go to learn more uh, detail about some of the various models and, and methods that are out there now. I think that one's also hard to have rules on because it depends upon the population that you're trying to align. You have prospective, retrospective attribution. You have regional trends, statewide trends. Do you want to align it with a pricing model at a plan? Do you not? Uh, and Aaron's right. There, there's just a lot of variability there because you're aligning the value-based program to hit a certain goal or a certain metric. And it all depends on what the population size is. And so it, I think that one would be very tricky to try to standardize at this time. Thank you both. Um, so I want to switch gears a little bit into rural health, which is something a topic we haven't touched upon yet. Um, so a significant portion of North Carolinians live in rural counties. So Troy, oh. are there any specific techniques that Blue Cross has uh, implemented in order to engage providers in these communities? Yeah, and that, that would be um, through our aggregator program. And so um, aggregators for everybody um, on the webinar are basically entities that are able to pool risk or pool resources together to be able to allow uh, physician sets that are, that are smaller or maybe don't have as many members aligned with them to be able to take on risk and have reporting and uh, be able to operate um, in a collective fashion rather than individually. And so <clears throat> you can imagine that in, in, in rural pockets of our state, the, the practice 
size may have just a handful of docs, the number of Blue Cross members at that practice might be a couple hundred members. But if the aggregator can come in, uh, they can pool their 100 to 300 members with another 100 to 300 members, and then basically you'll get a, a population size that's big enough to actually measure and then take action on. And so what we're doing is we're using partners like Alidaid, we're using partners like Caravan, who's had success in other uh, rural markets across the state. Uh, across the southeast uh, in the country and and really trying to uh, figure out ways to provide channels for people to plug into value and another thing that we're doing is that the, it's not just blue cross value based contracts when cms is requiring physicians to go to value people need help there and so we're, we're allowing for some of the some of the uh, cross-payer uh, pollination within these aggregators to occur as well so it, we, we are trying to provide the channels to allow everybody to access value-based care where they're at. Thanks, Troy. We have a few more minutes left, so um, I will wrap this up with a couple more questions. Um, are there any specific disease states that Blue Premier or the A to B plans to focus on in the future? So right now, everything's been very um, broad brush. Primary care model, look at your standard HEDIS metrics, uh, try to align with CMS where you can, A1C, uh, breast cancer screening, et cetera. You know, very, very standard fare, I'd say, for what we're doing on value. For specialty models, we've looked, we have a behavioral health model that's in development. We also just started a advanced kidney care model to take a look at CKD and ESRD. I think when, we, when we're when we looking at new opportunities, we can go one of two ways. Keep going for specialties. So let's have a cardiology model, let's have an onco model, let's have an ortho model. Or do we start going to conditions where this question's going? So like, do we have a, di a diabetic model or a hypertension model, let's say, COPD, something, and CHF. Uh, so, we're trying to figure out the best way to do that because it's they're not mutually exclusive of each other there's overlap but when you're talking about how to best manage patient populations we need something that's going to resonate with the physician set as well as help us bring more people into value-based care uh, both from a member side and a provider side and so i think over time we are going to be expanding into condition-based models as well as keep expanding our specialty based models as we go One final question here. Um, has claims coding accuracy and risk adjustment been a consideration in the BBP arrangements? If so, what do you do to encourage accurate coding? So all of our value-based programs at, at North Carolina, we emphasize quality first. We have quality metrics that are a large part of how we measure uh, performance. Mm -hmm and set payment, but the other part is we have a pretty uh, healthy target around risk sharing and, and data sharing requirements. And so by having that in play, and as well as the corresponding reporting that goes along with it, here's your care gaps, here's your coding gaps. And then we also have a physician engagement team that, that meets on a regular basis to help people uh, plug into our workflows and make sure that they're hitting their overall targets. The short answer is yes <laughs> to this question. And we have a lot of different dimensions uh, to be able to help um, our value partners get to where they need to be. Thanks, Troy. Uh, with that, we can wrap up our Q&A session. Um, our next scheduled webinar will be on June 22nd in collaboration with NACHA. We'll have a conversation on topics including revenue cycle management and healthcare payments data. You can't make the webinar please be sure to register and we'll get all the materials to you uh, we have a summer of fun planned and we'll announce our next few webinars over the course of the next month i want to give a big thank you to troy aaron and jessica for the informative presentation and discussion and thank you all for joining us today uh, once I end the session, you'll see an end of the webinar survey. We definitely want your feedback and your questions. And feel free to email us at core at caqh.org. Uh, please have a rest, great rest of your day. Thank you all.
Thank you. Thanks, everyone.